Avatsala is a strategy and innovation and operational excellence leader with business, technical, and organizational skills focusing in the biopharmaceutical industry with 16 plus years of experience. She has worked at four different biopharmaceutical companies from R&D to clinical and commercial manufacturing operations. She's skilled at driving transformation roadmaps from R&D to commercial manufacturing. Expertise around process simplification and optimization, implementation of best class, best in class technology and digital solutions and developing high performing organizations. A strategic thinker who is able to translate vision and strategy into operational out, uh, solutions, passionate about innovation and technology, global networking, benchmarking, and experience in multicultural environments. Vatsala is currently the operational excellence lead for Sanofi R&D North America. Vatsala, thank you so much for joining us. You have such a, an impressive uh, background and expertise. I'm so excited to see what you have to say. Um, and with that, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Andy. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. It looks great. Okay. Okay, um, thank you again for the introduction. Hi, my name is Batsla Sadasivan, um, and I'm the um, Head of Operational Excellence for R&D um, for Sanofi's North American region. Um, so just to give you a very quick background, as Andy mentioned, um, you know, most of my operational excellence um, experience comes from the manufacturing space. So that's where I spent, I would say, about at least seven years in the manufacturing space um, and over the um, last four and a half years basically almost five years i've basically um, been driving operational excellence in the r d space although it's been quite long i still feel that it's still very new because i'm still learning it's what i found is that it's really different compared to the manufacturing space so, and the challenges that comes with it and then you um, and I'll explain why and then how do you overcome this challenge and how do you drive um, operational excellence in the research and development space so that's really what my talk is going to be focused on um, so just a quick summary of the agenda um, so as I explained first I would like to give you a quick background in terms of my from my experience what is the challenge in applying operational excellence in the research and development space uh, compared to the traditional manufacturing space and then once you understand the challenge then the next question is how do you then develop a roadmap an operational excellence roadmap and with that also i'll give you some case studies and then um, some summary with some uh, key messages so first of all um I would like to just go through really briefly in terms of understanding the r d value stream processor so the it for r d basically it all comes down to projects one project equals to one product essentially so to make one biologics drug or what we call product the the lead time takes about 10 to 12 years by the way so there itself you you have a big challenge the fact that the lead time is so long and if you compare this to the manufacturing space where you have tens and hundreds of batches um so and as we know that with um, when you have um, short such long lead time you have less data essentially yeah? and with less data it's more gets more difficult to do process optimization work so that's one challenge right there the other challenge is that no one person owns this entire value streamer from early discovery to launch it's managed by various different cross-functional teams um, across the life cycle of the drug so in the beginning for example it starts with a research team and then um, once you, um, it hits what we call the, the milestone where a candidate is selected a, a drug candidate then it switches to another team called cmc and then and so on and so forth so there's no one owner essentially for this end-to-end -end processor so what that means it makes it very highly matrix and then on top of that what I call the y-axis and now you put 
um, the other what business processes which cuts across the x axis which is your drug development process and these business processes they run across the different stages of the life cycle of the drug development process and I've listed here some examples such as procurement process, sh shipping, contract management, budget, so on and so forth. Um, the challenge with these business processes is that typically we do not own them. R&D does not own these processes. They are large corporate processes. So in order to make any changes or improvements to these processes, we can't do it ourselves. So and on and uh, and what that means is that it makes it even more matrix. So that's what you see here, the juxtaposition when you put the drug development process with the business processes, it becomes a highly matrix environment. And so this R&D landscape imposes the challenge basically yeah, based on these, um, from an organizational standpoint, just as I mentioned first, because you have a long lead time um, and then you have a highly matrix uh, process for the value stream um, that and also the business process interfaces is also very highly matrix and with many stakeholders. So that's the challenge that you need to think of first from an organizational standpoint. How are you going to drive efficiencies? And then the second challenge is a cultural challenge, which is actually the most difficult one. Um, as all of us know, as operational excellence leaders, um, you know, cult making changes is never easier yeah, for anybody. Um, so we all struggle with this, but in the research and development space, it's much more difficult because here you're dealing with scientists and they're a very different set group of people. So they are basically creative, innovative people. Um, so oftentimes, you know, I get asked like, you know, ma'am, how can we apply these principles in R&D? You know, we're not manufacturing. They feel that you are almost putting them into like a, into a square box with defined boundaries. Um, they feel that, you know, this is going to impede their creativity in some ways. So, um, but the irony is that what I found is day to day scientists are struggling every day in the bench with bureaucratic processes they have to deal with, which takes away their capacity from doing science. So basically they're spending their time doing these non value added um, bureaucratic processes and, and these processes typically are these business processes that are cut that cuts across the drug development process so, so it's really the, the the cultural challenge here to overcome is really how do you actually um uh, make the scientists realize right that actually they can do better science by operating more efficiently that it's not going to impede your science so now that you understand the challenges in the r d space then how do you develop a roadmap? That's the next question. So from my experience and benchmarking um, across the pharmaceutical industry and also other industries uh, for R&D, what I found is that it is still very young. There's still very few of us compared to the manufacturing or service industry. And there is no cookie cutter or standardized approach. Um, like you do in the manufacturing space, because traditionally these methodologies, approaches, they come from the manufacturing space, but you can't take that and just dump it and force it into R&D. It's not going to work. So you have to, you have to adapt and fit to the R&D process. That's really the key message here. So this is an example of a roadmap that I'm sharing. It's sort of my own, what I call recipe essentially. So typically what you have is your strategic roadmap, what you have on top in R&D, and that's really usually very clear to people. But the operational accent roadmap is about how do you execute, right, your strategy into operational solutions to drive performance in R&D. That's really what this roadmap is. So here I use three guiding pillars, and these are what I call the operational pillars. They're not strategic pillars. They're different. Um, so in in, a, in, in any improvements that you want to drive, right? First, you need to look at capacity. What does that mean, right? The goal of the capacity pillar here is to make sure that you have enough capacity um, to execute your strategy. Yeah? That's from a people standpoint, equipment and space. And then in the capability pillar, um, this is about um, having the optimal capability again uh, to enable you to execute your strategy. So you have two types of capability. First is the people capability. That's what are the types of competency and skills I need, roles and organizational structure. 
Um, and then the second capability is technology and innovation. In R&D, that's extremely important, uh, especially um, implementing best-in-class technology and digital solutions um, to stay um, with the industry best practice and also to drive performance. Um, and then finally, the third pillar, processes. So here, it's the goal here is to identify the bottleneck processes. What I shared earlier on, it could be in your value stream technical drug development process, or it could be a process in the y-axis, which is a business process, or it could be both. So you really need to look at both axes and identify the bottleneck processes that are impeding you to execute the strategy, and then you basically go and um, fix them, essentially. Yeah? That's really what the third pillar. And then, of course, you need measures. What I found is in the R&D space, people do not measure as much, unfortunately. Yeah? So measurements are really key. And what I've listed here is some, ex um, what I would call the, uh, from the benchmarking, these are the typical measures that are used in the research and development space. First is productivity. So that's here typically drives down for us to in you know, a number of products in the pipeline over um, FTE that you have. Um, so the goal is to increase productivity, which is you know increasing the number of products in the pipeline with less man hours involved in the, pro uh, in the drug development process. Then the second piece is time, reducing time. So we all know with COVID, We've seen that we can't take 10, 12 years to make a drug, medicine, a drug. That days are over, so we really need to reduce the time, which translates to increasing the speed. How do I shorten that 10 to 12 years um, drug development time frame? And then the third piece is cost. Cost is becoming more and more of an issue in R&D because of a lot of um, competition and generic drugs out there. Um, this cost could be from a man hour standpoint or it could be um, cost in terms of um, your investment cost for initiatives, which is uh, return in investments and savings. And then the other piece very important is agility. So it's extremely important. While we drive these business efficiencies, we still need to be agile because we are R&D at the end of the day. So we're not in a commercial manufacturing space. So things are not fully locked in. You need to be operating in an agile way. So what that is, is you need to run, drive your roadmap in an agile approach, yeah, in short sprints. And that's really what that agility means, essentially. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and go through you with you a couple of examples, case studies, depending on time. And if you're more interested, feel free to send me um, questions offline and I can share with you a lot more uh, case studies. Um, the first case study here is about a, a process within the R&D drug development value stream, which I shared uh, earlier on, which is the x-axis. It's called a cell line development process. You can see in the um, diagram below. This is actually one of a very important step in making a biological drug. Be, be, um, it's the what we call the entrance point of a biologics product moving from research into the development phase. So for each, I call it a li the life of the drug. And the reason is because you only need to make one cell line for one product. And that carries through the entire life cycle of the drug development phase and the commercial phase manufacturing as well. So you need to make one cell line for one product. So what was the issue? So basically we have a global cell line development process that supports um, the global R&D product pipeline essentially. You need to make one cell line for one product as I explained to you. And we had a, an increase of our product pipeline more than 50% uh, for, and it, this happened in, for example, 2017. Uh, so within a year, we have, we have a significant increase in product pipeline. On top of that, um, these products are more diverse in modalities and the molecules are much more complex. So what the problem is that we found that the cell line development process was identified as a bottleneck to R&D yeah, due to this increase, sudden increase in pipeline. Um, if we don't fix this, we will not be able to meet the future product pipeline of the company essentially. So the goal here was really to increase the cell line development capacity or what you, we could measure it as productivity as well. 
um, we need to increase that by at least twofold within two years without increase without basically significant increase in headcount. That's really the goal here. So here it's a highly technical drug development process. And the case study is here now, how do you apply operational excellence? So very quickly, I'm just gonna share with you what is the process. Um, the process consists of two types of steps, technical steps, which are the blue steps, and then you also have governance steps. And these are really important because I think what um, scientists didn't realize is that they thought all the issues lie just in the technical steps, but the governance steps are extremely important because these are decision-making steps and they're showstoppers. You cannot proceed to the next step if you do not go to these governances. And so in terms of what the process is about, you start with a DNA sequence, so it's just a digital sequence, that no raw material, and you end up with a cells that can produce the drug. That's really the end product. And how do you measure the um, performance of this process? You can measure it by what we call productivity, which is the number of cell lines per year, and also time in terms of how long it takes. So how do we solve this problem? How do we reach that goal? What we did is we used a structured operational excellence methodology. Again, very simple, not rocket science, just basic process mapping. Map the process end to end, identify what are the inputs and outputs. And for inputs, you know, we make sure that we identify what are, who are, the, uh, what are the resources needed, um, e material, equipment, documentations needed. Um, and then also outputs the same thing and then identify who are the customers for each step and mapping out the gaps. From these gaps, you know, we came up with solutions and based on the solutions, we prioritized them based using um, a matrix and then which translated into our roadmap or our high level project plan, we call it. Uh. So based on these, um, the, um, the exercise we did, the key challenge we found was a highly complex interface, which is what I explained to you in early on, the R&D landscape, and that came out right away. So I think people were shocked, scientists, um, that, you know, they, because they thought it's more about the technical process we need to figure out here. But actually what was causing the most noise are the business processes, not the technical processes, such as the finance process here because we have to deal with um, outsourcing, for example. So you have to go to a finance process, IT process, because here we need to digitize um, all our data and the process. Um, so we have to deal with IT processes, procurement process, we have to deal with it because we were doing a lot of external testing. Shipping and logistics, such, uh, another example, because we have to do a lot of shipment between US and Europe. And we also have to deal with the CRO process because we have also externalized some um, steps in the process. Um, so the other really important thing in terms of overcoming the challenge, right, on top of using this structured operational excellence approach is transversal collaboration. I cannot explain to you. There's no way we could make change in, changes to all of these processes I shared with you just now. The, uh, that were considered bottlenecks by ourselves because we don't own them, most a lot of them. So we have to work with people across the company from research to development, also other uh, support functions, global functions such as finance, procurement, um, IT, even the manufacturing space. So transversal collaboration is very key. Um, so just give you a summary of how this roadmap um, started, uh, what it looks like. So in the beginning when we started, uh, when we identified the problem, these were the high level gaps we found with the cell line development process. We had a capacity constraint. We could feel it heavily in terms of people and equipment and even space because we couldn't buy more equipment because we didn't you know, have lab space. What we didn't know is what was the bottleneck for capacity? Is it people, is it equipment, is it space or is it everything? The process was fully manual. The data man management was fully manual. And then you had um, analytical testings. These are bioanalytical testings. That, that process was already constrained. That team couldn't even handle the, te the testing for the current cell um, productivity of the cell line. So if we have to increase by twofold, we know there was no way they can manage it. Then we only had one backup CRO for um, the external testing that was done. So if something happens with them, we'll be in trouble. 
and then we identified key processes that were causing what I call noise, and there was noise to the cell line development process. So this was taking away capacity from the scientists essentially. And these were the governance processes, shipping and logistics, um, external testing. So that's really a procurement process. That's what it is, a PO process. The report writing process was another um, bottleneck because it was fully manual, every, um, lot, lots of pages essentially. So how, so in order to get to our future state, which is um, really to um, increase our productivity by two folds, how we got, get, got there is by developing this operational excellence roadmap. And here is where I applied the sort of what I call a homemade recipe, which I shared just now using the three pillars, so capacity, capability, and processes. Um, so the roadmap consisted of three pillars. The goal of the capacity pillar here is to optimize the capacity utilization to meet the business needs, um, to look into the steps in terms of how can we increase the capacity, either from a people standpoint or even, um, it was really people that were focusing on equipment as well. Um, and then the goal of the capability pillar is to implement best in class technologies of focusing on digital solutions. Um, and the processes is to simplify the bottleneck processes that we identify. So essentially, um, so these three pillars consist of 16 goals. Basically, these are 16 solutions. So, so uh, if we put in place these 16 solutions, we'll be able to get to our final goal, which is to increase our um, productivity by two times at least. So I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through all the different example of goals because they are very different. They touch various different processes. But I'm going to give you some examples, very uh, high level and quick. So within the capacity pillar, one of the goal is to develop a capacity model. That's the first thing because we did not understand, in fact, what was our current capacity or what is our maximum theoretical capacity. So if you don't understand that, how do you know if I have enough capacity to meet the future? demand. So what we did here is here we applied principles of the manufacturing world, which is the scheduling system, how we schedule production um, lots, same principles we used there and applied it to the cell line development process because it is a process and you can treat it as a routine process because the steps are the same. And from there, we came up with the optimal scheduling system, you can call it, for the cell line development process. And that was really key because it determined in terms of how frequently I can start a cell line development process, essentially, or what we call project start frequency. Um, and with this, we have then a strategic tool to be able to um, facilitate business decisions so in terms of how many people I need and equipment to meet the business needs. Um, another example from the capacity pillar is a step within the cell line development, which we found that was um, basically very, um, it was very long and it took a lot of mandates of the scientists. Uh, so we did an analysis and found that outsourcing is going to be much more efficient for the process. And in fact, from a cost standpoint. So by outsourcing it, we were able to reduce significant amount of man hours. So these man hours that you see on the right, these are basically scientists time that saved uh, number of man hours saved per year, essentially. Uh, so that's how we were measuring it. Um, and then the within the um, capability pillar, the next example that I'm going to share with, sorry, another example in capacity is um, this is the testing, basically, the team, the testing process, the team that had to do the testing for the um, cell line development. So here they had limitations already as it is uh, to, to, to have the capacity to do the testing necessary. So in order to we know to go to two folds we need to improve the the analytics resources basically then what do we do here to fix it is we introduce automation automation of uh, methods um, and high, automation of uh, certain steps introducing high throughput methods automating the data management and optimizing ways of working and just with that we were increase able to increase at least 50 to 60% productivity, by the way, just for the analytical testing piece without increasing any FTE. In fact, we were able to reduce man hours in the process. Um, that's what this shows. 
Um, and then um, another example within the capability pillar. So capability here is about implementing innovation and technology, as I explained. So here we had a step, which is basically the clone generation step, a very critical step. It was extremely labor intensive and the process was so manual. So we fully automated that entire step. We brought in automation essentially. Um, and just by doing that, we were able to again, save significant scientists man hours again. Um, another example within the capability pillar is a, another um, step basically, which is um, what we call the, um, it's the flow cytometry screening step. This step was very long. Again, the data analysis was very manual. And what we realized is we had a very old legacy technology. So we implemented a best in class technology, which was able to shorten the time of the step, automate the data again, and then save scientists man hours again in that process. Um, some examples within the um, processes pillar. So the first bottleneck was the governance process. So what we found is that scientists, basically, their role here is to um, basically do science, essentially, or be in the lab, essentially. So in this case, develop cell lines. But they were spending a lot of time like running around like chickens doing coordination work because of lack of governances within the processes. That's really what was happening. Um, you know, there was an inefficient flow of data and decision making. So here, what we had to do is then, you know, improve the governance. How? By really coming up with clear roles and responsibilities, establishing clear requirements. So what needs to be done by when, and just by establishing these requirements, we were able again to save quite a bit of scientists man hours. So they can go back now and do um, science so instead of uh, managing these governances, which is not their role. Another example within the processes is a procurement process. So this is what we call the external testing. So in this cell line development process, there were several steps where we externalized the testing and that we have to go to a procurement process. This step was extremely cumbersome. It was just so long and complex. And, and why we found, because just for one cell line, there were just a, a ridiculous amount of POs, huh? purchase orders that were needed to be executed. Um, and what we did here is we just reduced totally the number of POs needed per cell line, and we removed a lot of non-value added steps. Here again, we had to work with finance, we had to work with procurement um, to change a global process. And just by doing that, the, this uh, external testing process became three times faster, and we were able again to save significant scientists' uh, man hours as well. And finally, the last example is uh, shipping process. So we had to do a lot of shipment between U US to Europe. Um, of cell lines. And we found the shipping process to be extremely complex. Again, it's just very long. It was taking about 20 to 30 days, essentially. Yep. So just to share with you to a uh, visual uh, in terms of what you think this process should be. So the common shipping route is from Boston to Europe, and that could be either Paris or Frankfurt. This was the most, the most uh, common route that we would have had to deal with. This was taking about 30 days, by the way, to do the shipment. Um, so we were joking internally. It takes much quicker for a human, you know, to take the cell lines, I guess, and just take a flight and go there because the flight's about seven hours and that's it. With the time difference and all, you should be able to do this in two days. That's what one of our senior leader asked. He said, you, you, this should be done in two days. Like, why is it th taking 30 days? And the answer is because what we found is that the process is so complex and convoluted. For one cell line, right, to ship, it took, takes 11 different roles involved in this process. Each shipment then took about 30 days lead time. And it takes 32 man hours, by the way, to manage the shipment end to end. If you add all the actors time, what that means is four full working days of someone to just coordinate the shipment for one cell line. So, and then we projected if now we have to increase the cell lines by twofold, we'll need at least more than a half FTE to just manage the shipments for cell lines. And in R&D, by the way, we don't just ship cell lines. So we ship all different materials. We ship cells to proteins, tissues, blood, plasma, viruses, even animals. So 
this actually really opened up a can of worms and we and realized like our shipping global shipping process is not working so we have to fix that process to again we don't own this process and this is a large massive process so by improving this shipping process then what the result is that now you're able to um ship three times faster that's really what it means and again safe against some scientist man hours um, time as well that's what you see over here so in terms of what was the outcome of this case study is that we were actually able to hit the project goal which is increase the productivity or by twofold and what that means is it's really a hundred percent increase in productivity and basically without any increase in headcount and what you see here that's insignificant and with that we were able to um, meet the pro uh, future product pipeline and on top of that we had uh, quite a bit of cost savings as well that came out of it um, and then another example let me see i think i have i still have a little bit more time so i'll share with you another different example another case study so this example is from the y-axis in the beginning. As I shared with you, you have the value stream x-axis, the technical product. The process I shared with you before was from the technical drug development. Now I'm gonna share with you an example of a process of a business process, a large process that cuts across the drug development process. And that process is what we call the expert engagement contract process or uh, in other words, some companies call it the HCP contract process. So in R&D, we work with a lot of scientific experts. So this could be doctors and academicians who are Nobel laureates and professors um, from the external ecosystem. It's one of the very um, crucial engagements for us in terms of sustaining innovation. So this process was overly, again, what we found was overly complex and long. And it was causing issues with, with our experts. I was straining our relationship because the process was too long. Um, and then the, we have a having late payments made to these um, experts. We had a compliance risk. We had event cancellations due to process delays and increase in costs. So the really the problem, what we found is that the process is too complex and long. It, it's taking about 200 days this process end to end and the goal here was to simplify this process by at reducing time at least by 80 percent that was our goal while maintaining compliance uh, and improving our relationships with them so how does this process look like so very different process than what i shared with you before it is a business process so and what you see in the blue steps are the the main process steps which is really it really is a more of a legal and a compliance process because you have to draft a contract, get a contract approved, and then you and and there's also a payment process that's involved, which is a finance and compliance process involved. So that's really what you see over here. It's a very different type of process. Um, so how do we overcome it? Again, transversal collaboration. R and D does not own this process. Huh? This process is owned by different people. Um, different steps are executed by different functions such as legal you have procurement involved there are transparency steps compliance medical so we had to work with people across these uh, functions basically large corporate functions again to simplify you know to influence and simplify this process um, and how do we solve the problem again very simple very similar we use very high level structured process mapping uh, map what the current process is identify the gaps designed a future state process um, that would essentially um, be solutions to all the gaps and then came up with a um, implementation plan which is a roadmap essentially for this um, program so in terms of outcome what we found uh, what came out of it is that we were able to um, increase a lot of unnecessary steps the contract was simplified significantly and that was one of the big bottlenecks just lengthy contract you know we were able to go from nine pages to one page also there were a lot of forms involved we were able to just remove these forms and simplify them and bring it down to just a short for one page form um, we also consolidated the roles what we found is there were a lot of different roles involved in the process so yes we know the more roles 
the more longer time it's going to take because there's more handoffs. So we created a role here where we said it's the business process coordinator. It, they're going to manage the entire end-to-end -end process. So what that means is they're going to take over the role um, of the medical team of also doing the contract itself. Uh, so from taking over from legal and then they'll also do the procurement steps. So what this means is they're actually gaining skills as well. So it's really a win-win situation here that this uh, business process coordinators were gaining competencies as well while this process is being simplified. And then we can give that time back to all these other stakeholders such as legal, medical procurement, so they can focus on their business critical activities. And with this, we were able to reduce the time down significantly. More, we basically hit the target of at least 80% reduction of time. So this is really what the outcome is that we were able to, um, to execute these expert engagement contracts six to 11 times faster, depending on the type of contract. And also we were able to also reduce cost on top of that uh, here from a man hours by 40%. So with that, I'm going to um, and come to the end of my talk. Um, just wanna leave you with some key takeaway. And this is really from my experience um, in being an operational excellence um, expert, you know, in different um, environments. What I found is that the road to operational excellence in R&D is still very young. Um, and, I, it, and it's not just because it's, um, it's not young just in Sanofi. It's young in the pharmaceutical industry. It's young in all other companies based on what I've done with benchmarking. Um, it's young compared to the manufacturing and service businesses because um, this culture of, has not really been embedded into the scientific space. Um, and then it's also much more complex to do it com in compared to the manufacturing space. As I shared earlier, why? Because of the landscape that's highly matrix, which requires then significant transversal collaboration. So really you've got to influence people here you know, without authority across the company. Um, and the other very important piece, you cannot take the traditional methodologies and just fit and force it. You need to adapt and fit it to the R&D processes. And finally, it requires cultural changes within the organization, extremely important. But the message is that it can be done. I've showed you some case studies um, and we continue to have lots of other case studies. Hopefully I can share different ones in future. What the case studies have demonstrated is the impact actually yeah, of operational excellence that it, what it can do for R&D, even though it's a very different space, that it shows that how you can apply these principles to transform R&D into a more a highly efficient organization. And in fact, it can help drive scientific excellence. It's not going to impede your science, but it, you can actually do better science by operating more efficiently. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, end my presentation and I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Vatsala. That was uh, fascinating. Uh, operational excellency in research and development. Um, man, a lot of experience there. I love the case studies. You really presented a lot of information in a very uh, you know, f uh, easy to follow uh, process. So we have a few questions here for you. Um, so first, how did you overcome the challenges faced in the case studies. So could you repeat? Sorry, Andy. Yeah, no worries. So how how did you overcome the challenges faced in the case studies that you okay. just presented on? Yeah, so, uh, and I touched on that. Uh, I, so it's really, um, as I explained to you, first is you got to apply the structured methodologies. I think mm -hmm. that's really important, but in a very simple way. So what I mean by that, don't use any jargons and terminologies like what we know, lean or all these jargons. Mm -hmm. It's really, you know, basically just, you know, working with a scientist and saying, you know, how can I help you to fix your problems? So, so just by applying structured problem solving methodologies that's one the second thing is by really working with people across the company as i explained to you the transversal collaboration so is really gaining um, building a relationship and gaining trust how to do that is really what we did here is having a road show where we spent months in fact just mm -hmm. traveling across us and europe meeting people and explaining why we need to do this 
Um, and if we don't fix it, we're not going to be able to meet our company pipeline. So that's really the transversal collaboration piece, I would say. Um, so I would say those are the key main uh, ways to overcome the challenges. Okay. And of course, by having also a very strong sponsor, which is really important here. In this mm -hmm. case, um, we had a sponsor that understood um, about business um, efficiencies um, and not just in the scientific standpoint. Interesting. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And then the case studies you presented, I think, showed that very well. Um, so, you know, we have a few more minutes left, so I'll just I'll jump to the last question. Um, do you prefer applying operational excellence in the manufacturing space or in the R&D space after your diverse experiences? Okay, yep. so that's a really good question. And in fact, it's something that I think about all the time in my head in terms of what would be my next step. Like, do I go back to manufacturing? Do I stay? What do I do? And it's really hard. What I think it's per very personal for me. I like to build. What I don't, what I know, what I don't like is staying in a routine mode. Mm -hmm. So I think it really depends. I mean, I, uh, as of now, I prefer to be in the research and development space because there's so much to build and the impact is high because it's still young. And you can make really high impact, and we need it because it's taking so long time to make drugs. 10 to 12 years in the manufacturing space. I mean, it's getting, there's more well-established methods and roadmaps. So we're still very young, by the way, pharmaceutical industry. As an industry, what I found is even the manufacturing space, right, in terms of operational excellence, it's young compared to other types of industries, such as let's say automation or oil and gas and services. And then on top of that, within the pharmaceutical industry, R&D is even more, it's even younger, uh, in terms from a um, function standpoint, so I like the challenge. So that's and I feel that's very high impact. You, you know, you can really bring science and business um, together here. But that doesn't mean that in future we won't consider going back to the manufacturing space if there's a challenge where we really need to have um, a high impact transformation. You know, I would definitely be very glad as well to do that. Awesome. Well, we're about to be, uh, you know, at our time. So, uh, is there any last-minute questions or comments you want to leave the audience with uh, pertaining to operational excellence within R and D? Yeah, I can repeat the question if you if you'd like me to. <laughs> uh, did did the audio cut out there? I think the audio may have cut out. Are you there, Andy? Yes, can uh, can you hear me? Is there? I lost you just for a short time in audio. Oh, sorry about that. Um, well, I was just gonna say, is there uh, any last minute um, comments or questions or any last minute things you wanna leave the audience with um, pertaining to operational excellence in R&D? Well, I, I think I covered most of it in my presentation. I think one of it is I'm really looking to benchmark um, I think that's one of the things I really get out of these conferences when I, um, for over the last few years. So if any of you are in the R&D space, you know, please do reach out. I would love to make a connection and benchmark because I feel alone actually because there's so few of us in this space. So I think that would be very, and also even um, those of you from in the other um, space, you know, I would love to keep in touch and bring, um, bounce ideas and get your thoughts. Think that would be um, highly efficient. That's my biggest learning. I can tell you from um, in terms of how to drive operational excellence um, in the R&D space has been from conferences. Really, it's from benchmarking with peers and staying up to date with industry best practices and really using that and um, applying it. So um, I think I would be I would appreciate it very much if we can keep in touch. And um, and also I'll be glad to come back. Definitely, Beatles mm -hmm. uh, is a conference that I find very very highly um, uh, beneficial and impactful in the operational excellence space. So thank you again for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, Vatsala Sadasivan, thank you so much for joining and, and presenting on an incredible topic. Um, we are uh, at end time for the third session of the day, but in about 15 minutes we'll be jumping into the fourth session. Um, so we'll be, we'll be signing off here in a second, but. 
join us again in about 10 minutes and we will wrap up the day with our fourth session with Christina Duda. So thank you for joining us. And again, big thanks to uh, Vatsala Sadasivan. Um, we'll see you guys in about 10 minutes. So go uh, do what needs to happen in the next few uh, little break and we'll see you then.